I said, I'm rounding off our series on James this morning. And I kind of think any study of James, whether you do it on your own, uh, in a group setting, or in a whole church context as we have here, is always going to throw up big challenges. It's partly due to his straight talking, giving it both barrels, writing style, but also the topics that he touches on as well. Over the last few weeks, we've looked at enduring suffering, taming tongues, the requirement for faith to produce action, and the need for humility and not being a friend to the world uh, from Jamie last week. And I hope you have felt challenged, actually, because even though this letter was written 2,000 years ago, with its own context for writer and recipients, it's full of topics with a direct relevance for today. In those 2,000 years since, we've still not figured out how to exercise restraint with our words or to stay out the comfort zone of inaction with our faith, have we? And this stuff can perhaps make it a little bit uncomfortable to read the book of James or to listen to these talks. And to be honest, this morning might also fall into that category. But I just wanted to open with a bit of an encouragement that even though the challenge can be a little uncomfortable and may require some self-reflection, that if we embrace that with humility and the knowledge that we've all got weak points in our discipleship game, that no one is the finished product, then we are best positioned to get the most out of the book of James as a whole and to figure out what we can take from it. We've already heard a lot of the context around this letter and its recipients. The writer was most probably James, the half-brother of Jesus. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem at the time of the book of Acts, uh, and he was the half-brother of Jesus. And he is writing to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. This scattering is most likely due to the persecution that came to those Jews who became Christians in the early days and weeks after Pentecost that you can read about in Acts. But although the the Christians in Jerusalem were forced to scatter, they took the word of the gospel with them to the places they went. We can also read about this persecution in places like Hebrews, where in chapter 10, the writer references a whole range of ways in which the recipients had braved suffering for the gospel including insults, persecution, and confiscation of property. And so if we think about this letter through James's eyes, he is in a position of spiritual authority over this growing church in Jerusalem, teaching them about Jesus and what it means to be under the new covenant and leaving elements of the Mosaic law behind and going ahead into this new and exciting way of being able to know God and the new community of the church. It's all going great. Then all of a sudden, they've all had to flee. Suddenly, many of these people that James had been teaching, for, teaching and caring for have gone, spread far and wide. Those of you who are regular attenders will know that we have had a relationship with church leaders in Ukraine going back several years. And this is an experience we've heard about them sharing when Russia invaded a year last February. Their people, their church family, just sort of gone, scattered throughout Europe. And like those Ukrainian leaders, James's care for these people didn't end because they had to leave. And so this letter is written to, to them to teach them how to deal with the new circumstances of life, as well as some more general teachings to help them not to fall away and keep living a life that is pleasing to God. So let's consider the position of the recipients scattered to these different places outside of the country that they would call home. This would definitely have meant giving up the agricultural lifestyle that would have been very common in first century Israel. And so how would they have been making money? What would they have been doing once they left? Well, this may have meant moving between different cities in Greece and Asia Minor, where there would have been communities of Jewish people all around to link up with and settle with in each place. Perhaps they would have had a trade that they could have found work in for a while in one city, maybe picked up some informal work, earn some money before either deciding to stay or move on to another. A biblical example of this sort of lifestyle um, is actually the Apostle Paul, who in Acts move around the Mediterranean primarily to preach the gospel and would sometimes support his ministry by plying his trade as a tent maker. If you had the skills, it seems that it was possible to move from city to city and there would be work to do and money to be made. And we would normally think of those fleeing persecution as vulnerable, economically speaking. Um, But the thread of materialism and warning to the wealthy is a strong thread through James's letter, which means I think we've got to conclude that the people who were fleeing were able to find this work and to land on their feet in the places that they were running to. 
And so armed with that knowledge, we're going to have a look at today's passage. It's James 4, 13, 17. Feel free to find it in your own Bibles, or it'll be on the screen behind me. It says this, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Some classically strong words from James there. You can almost feel the difference between James, a man born into a builder's family, and someone like Paul, who we may be used to reading in the New Testament. Paul, a well-educated man who was used to considering the- philosophical and theological arguments and talking around them at great length. Not James. He's very direct, not using any more words than he has to. But given that style, given his straight talking, I think it's really important to carefully consider what he is specifically trying to address in this verse. And so the roadmap for the remainder of this talk is I'm first going to try and be very clear about what I think James is speaking against here, the attitude of the verse 13 speaker, which I think has three elements to it. And then we'll discuss James's three-pronged response to that attitude, and then I'll conclude with three brief applications from it. Yeah, I'm very much speaking in threes this morning. Okay, so first, what is the problem here? I want to try and to try and dig into what I think that is. What are the attitudes behind what that verse 13 speaker is saying? What is James trying to teach against here? Because it's easy to just dive straight into a passage like this and think, well, I don't really see a problem. What's wrong with these people traveling around and planning to make money? And we might be able to jump straight to our context and think, well, like we might do that. We might do financial career planning. Is there anything wrong with any of that? And questions like that can start flying around when we see a passage like this. And is any of that what this passage is talking about? Well, I would say no, and not immediately, and we need to take a little step back. And the overall thrust of this passage is about how we think about the future and how that relates to our relationship with God. So how do we think about the future? What attitudes might we be sharing that this th- verse 13 speaker is being corrected on by James here. Well, as I said, I think there are three. The first is a boastful confidence about the future, that their plans to go wherever and make money are set in stone. It's just a matter of saying, I'm going to go and do this, and it'll happen, no problem. And this does seem like a slightly odd thing for people who have been scattered, uprooted from their homes to be saying, doesn't it? You'd have thought if this had happened to you, you'd have less of that kind of confidence and boasting. But it seems that word has reached James of this kind of attitude being prevalent among the Christians who've left or perhaps among the communities that they settled with. This issue of an arrogance regarding the future is pretty central to what James has to say here, and he reinforces it in verse 16, saying, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. But I don't think that's all he has in mind here. I think there's a second issue with the verse 13 speaker, and that is that their future plans are centered around making money and chasing material things. James has a response to that that's coming up a bit later, so I'll dive into that issue a bit more then. The third issue, which is closely linked, is about the posture towards God of the speaker. They're not putting God in his rightful place regarding their future. Regarding these two points, I don't think it's a coincidence that this five-verse section is between a section about humility before God that we heard about last week and warnings about a life lived to gain wealth, which begins chapter five. That's where this section comes. And I think this passage provides a bridge between them as both these topics are contained within the verse 13 speaker's words. And so I think these issues at play are an arrogance or boastfulness regarding the future of chasing material possessions and of having an attitude of self-centeredness in our future plans, and finally, lacking humility before God in them. And I think that James gives a very direct response to each of these in the following verses. But just before I get to that, 
I wanted to demonstrate these issues in maybe a bit more of a relatable context, the more immediate context. What might it look like for me, you, or someone you know, to be living these attitudes out? What might that sound like? So I had to think about that, and I thought the best way to do that would be to stick to what I do best and to do some boasting in arrogant schemes. I really hope this is not the bit that you remember from this morning's talk or that I can be ever heard to be saying any of this stuff, but I'll be assuming the role of the verse 13 speaker for um, the next minute or so. So for those who don't know, I'm a maths teacher in a wonderful international school about seven miles outside of Shrewsbury called Concord College. It is an excellent place to work, and I really love what I do about 90% of the time, which is pretty good. And if I were to stand up here and talk about my future plans and say to you, well, I love what I do, and it's a really good way of supporting my family to live comfortably, and so I think I'm just going to keep working there for another 40 years. I've planned how to teach everything at this point, so I can basically just rock up and do it. I uh, don't really have to do any work anymore. Uh, and so it will get easier and easier. And, you know, I'll get a promotion or two over the years, and that will earn me a bit more and make me a bit more important at work, and, which is great. And I'll be able to move into a bigger house and buy a bigger car. And then after all those 40 years, I'll have comfortably earned enough to enjoy my 20-plus year retirement. That's what I'm going to do. That's the plan. I'm sticking to it. If you didn't agree before, I'm fairly sure that you'll now be sitting there very much thinking, agreeing with James, that people who are talking like this are bragging and don't have a wise attitude towards their future. And so how would you begin to address those things? How would you speak back to me? How would you slow me down and try and correct me on that? Well, he addresses these issues in the following verses. The first up is the confidence about future plans. And verse 14 speaks a profound truth, doesn't it? why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. With my own arrogant scheme that I just laid out, what confidence can I have in any of that? How can I boast in any of those things? I have no idea what twists and turns are coming for me in the next few decades, years, months, or even weeks and days. I don't know if my health will allow me to work that long. I don't even know if the college that I work at will still exist in 40 years' time, or if anyone there would ever want to give me a promotion. I don't know if my wife's career will take us different places. I don't know if God's got different plans for me, if Jesus is going to come back before I retire, or, to be brutally frank, how many years I have left on this earth. These things are all uncomfortable to think about, because it's human nature to think we have a large element of control over our future, and that we can map it out. But if we all think back over the last five years, ten years, I'm sure we could all think of things that have happened to us that have changed the plan, changed the course of our life um, to something different to what we might have mapped out. And so what James is saying to his original readers and us is don't be boasting about these futures that you're laying out for yourself because they are by no means guaranteed. As I said, behind, these verse, behind this verse is an attitude that time is completely at our disposal and our futures are just a matter of what we want to do. If I want to go and trade here, I can do it. If I want to go and live here, I can do it. But as I've tried to show you with my future, that's not true for me and I don't think it's true for you either. And so this thought that we don't know what's coming tomorrow, that's just good wisdom for life, isn't it? But this uncertainty about the future is something that's common to all people, whether you know God or not. And so what difference does our faith make in thinking about these things? Well, there's a wonderful quote from Charles Spurgeon, who's a 19th century Baptist preacher and writer, relating to this passage that says, There are two great certainties about things that shall come to pass. One is that God knows, and the other is that we do not know. What we can rely on is that we have a God, we know a God who is sovereign over all things. All things. And we can have a relationship with him, and that stuns me all the time. The sovereignty of God is discussed and affirmed throughout all of Scripture, in so many different places and in so many different ways. I could pick a thousand examples, probably, to talk about this morning. We can read about how God is behind the unfolding story of Israel. He is the one making everything happen. Isaiah, in particular, reflects on this. He's talking about things that will come to pass and questions, who else could do this? Who else could say what will happen 
and actually make it come to pass? Who could do that except God Almighty? These themes of God's sovereignty continue to the New Testament, where we can read about how God has brought about our salvation through Jesus, according to his pleasure and his will. And this has been predestined by him from the very beginning. Again, who else could do that except the sovereign God? And it goes all the way through to Revelation, the end of the book, where the end of the story is already written. Who else but God could do that? Who else could write the end of the story? And now that he has, who could change it? No one. No one can change those things that are written down and established. No one can change it, add to it, or take away from it. And even though we know the sovereign God, that doesn't mean our paths through life are always straight and easy. Evidently, that is not the case. But our response to God's sovereignty, when we think about the future, can only be trust in him. Not the boastfulness that James has in his sights here, that likes to pretend it's actually all in our control, but trust instead in God's character, his unfailing love, mercy, and faithfulness. These are truths that will go on and on and on and on and on. Even though from our point of view, we don't know what's coming next. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. And so the path of life may look rocky and windy and uneven. We can trust in the sovereignty of God. And that if we know him, we are secure in his hands. And that our ultimate future is secure in Christ. We are on firm ground in that sense, in terms of our eternal destiny. More on this to come in just a second. So that's the first issue with the verse 13 attitude. The second issue is about chasing wealth and material things. And I think James addresses this in the second half of verse 14 where he says, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Yeah, just a lot of nice, fun, lighthearted stuff for this snowy Sunday morning. There are lots of challenges and warnings in the Bible about a life lived for material things, particularly in the New Testament. Two from Jesus himself are in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, where he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Mark 8, 36. What good is it for someone to gain the entire world yet forfeit their soul? There's a common thread in these warnings that the benefits from living a life for material things is just so temporary. And if we think about our plans for the future, are they based around what is temporary? Are they based around meeting these earthly wants and desires? Or are they about about building something permanent, about building the kingdom of God and playing our part in that? To help me demonstrate this point, I've asked two glamorous assistants to come and assist me with a little illustration. Sorry, I probably caught you unawares there. Take your time. No stress. So they're going to come. Uh, I should also apologize to you people on Zoom if you can't clearly see what's going on here. I obviously didn't anticipate snow and that so many of you would be there. Also, if you're catching up on a podcast or YouTube, I can only apologize. I'll try and do a bit of audio description of what's going on here. So I've got two friends here spreading out a rope along the hall in front of me here. I've got Georgia at one end. That'll do. It doesn't matter. As long as, as can you elevate, try and elevate it a little bit. Hannah, it's okay. You just can just lift it up. Don't worry. Just That's fine. So we have a big, long rope in front of us here so that, um, and this is a timeline representing your entire existence. Okay, it's perhaps a little bit too long for my purposes this morning. Um, So we have a rope here which is representing your entire existence. Starting at George's end, going all the way to Hannah's end. And if you're a follower of Jesus, um, you can look forward to a literal eternity in heaven dwelling with God, not separated from him by anything, living in a place where there is no pain, no tears, no sorrow, and we can enjoy those treasures in heaven that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 6. That is a future that is completely secure. Whatever you do, as long as you know Jesus, as long as you've put your trust in him, as long as you have called him your Lord and Savior, that is your future. 
And I've put a bit of red tape at one end of, of George's end of the rope there. I think you're just about in the camera. That's good. Well done. Um, I've scaled it up quite a lot, so hopefully you guys on Zoom uh, and uh, at the back of the hall could see. And so this bit of the red tape, that represents your life on Earth. Okay, if that's our entire eternity, the red bit is our life on earth. So there's a little bit peeling off there. That maybe is your childhood and your 20s and your 30s and then, and then into middle age. And then there's a point where the red tape ends and the rope begins. And as Dave mentioned, we've talked about that, about how death is a doorway into resurrection life, into eternal life. This eternity in heaven will be beyond the very best picture we could produce in our minds. Better than the most skilled artist could illustrate. Better than what the poets could ever describe. I wish I had the words to articulate the wonder and the beauty and the glory of what it will be like, but I'm afraid that I just don't. But what we do in the red bit, in our earthly life, matters in the rest of the rope. Are we living just to make the red bit just a little bit better or a bit more comfortable? Is that what our lives are for? It's a really important question that the passage opens up at this point because we have a chance to build something permanent in the white bit, both for ourselves, yes, um, Jesus tells us to store up treasures for ourselves in heaven, but also in making him known, in glorifying our Savior and giving him the fame and honor that he is due. When we see our eternity laid out like this, why would we live to build up rewards to be enjoyed in the tiny little red bit at the start, the mist that appears and then goes, instead of storing up treasures in heaven to be enjoyed for the entire remainder of the rope, instead of playing our part in a kingdom that will last forever? Thank you to my volunteers. You can sit down. No, I don't need it anymore. That's fine. Thank you. Yes, good job. Of course, it's not always that kind of simple, direct choice between the two. I definitely think, I don't want to lead, uh, cause confusion. I certainly think that God's calling for some is to be influential in their workspace. And this can come with material benefits. And the work that churches and charities are doing across the world could not happen without people giving generous, generously. So it's really a question of how our life is orientated. Is it orientated, pointing towards the material things? or towards serving Christ? Is it like those who James is writing to, thinking solely of where they can go to make money? Or is it with a perspective of the eternal? And it really takes some faith to do this, doesn't it? You've really got to believe that the white bit of the rope is coming afterwards, to live to please God and earn those rewards in our eternal future that we can't see now, Instead of building up things that we can see and that we can count and experience right now, that's not easy. There might be a trade-off there at times. But James has already written of the need for action to accompany our faith. And he, just like Jesus, just like Paul, just like Peter, elsewhere in the New Testament, reminds us that this eternity is a sure thing. It's worth betting the house on, to borrow a phrase. And so the first comeback to the verse 13 speaker is that we cannot be boastful about our future because we don't know what's coming. The second is about building a future around the money we might want to make or the material things we might want to chase rather than what God wants is a little short-sighted. And this leads me into James's third point, which is that there is a much better way to live. Verse 15 reads, Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. So why is that better? What makes that a healthier view of our future? I think firstly and most importantly, it, put, it puts God in his rightful position in our lives and in our hearts. This heart attitude puts our future in God's hands. It acknowledges that we cannot see our future. It cuts out the boasting of verse 13 and puts us in a position of being humble before God. It also involves putting a trust in God and his sovereignty that I talked about earlier making it far more than something we might just sing about on a Sunday morning or read about in our Bibles. Rather, it's something we actually build our futures on. This is where we can take great encouragement from this passage as well, because so many people spend so much time searching for meaning 
and purpose. But we, as Ephesians 2.10 says, are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which are prepared in advance for us to do. We have a place to take in the service of the kingdom of God. We have a God-designed purpose which builds for us something far more valuable than the material things of this world. There's a lot of reassurance for us in this too. Because when the big decisions in life comes up or things seem really chaotic and we're feeling a bit lost, we can ask the question, what is God's will? What is God's will? And we can do all we can to follow what we think that path is. And that we're not always going to get that right, and it's not always going to be easy. James has already spoken of the need for endurance through suffering that his recipients are going to need to do. And it's a common theme of the New Testament. Saying that we're going to do the Lord's will is not signing ourselves up for an easy life, but one worth more value in eternity than anything that can be gained on the earth. And that brings me to the final verse of the passage. Anyone then who knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. This is the conclusion to all this, and it's one of those things that may be easy to say, easy to agree with, but hard to put into practice. If we're going to live with the right posture towards God, putting him in his rightful place over us, not to build our own kingdom, but his, we must be ready to do what God has called us to do. And this has to be where we put our future firmly in his hands. This is not easy either, particularly when it involves risk. A small testimony that I have about this is that in 2018, I was working at a college in Cardiff, coming to the end of my second year there. I'd always had in mind to spend three years there. I was enjoying life in the city. My church there was wonderful, um, and it was a massive part of my faith journey. The team that um, I was in at the college was to be rejigged a little bit, and as part of that, I was offered a new and improved job role. It all sounded great. But one evening as I prayed, I felt very clearly that I shouldn't take this new role and actually should leave the college. It's a good thing that God spoke so clearly because I definitely wavered over the next few weeks and months as I said some sad goodbyes and prayed and searched for what I should do next. And as these weeks and months rolled by, I never got any more inspiration. Nothing that I really wanted to do, uh, even though I applied for things here and there, Even though I told my boss at the college that I was leaving, he said he would keep the job open for me as I had nothing to move on to. And I prayed and I searched and I applied and I was coming up with nothing. No ideas. Yet I still knew from that time that I prayed that one evening that it was God's will that I didn't stay in that job. And so when August rolled around, a new academic year about to start, I got the call. Matt, have you got something new lined up or are you coming back? I still knew in my heart that the answer to both questions was no. That was really, really, really hard. (laughs) My will, particularly at that point, would have been to stay, given all of the good things that I had there. But being able to look back on it now, I can see that it just wasn't God's will for me to do that. He was calling me to take the next steps that have actually led me to be up here speaking this morning. I ended up not getting any job, any full-time job for the year after, which felt like a real loss at the time. But I did some online tuition in maths that led to me building the skills that I would need to apply for the job that I have now and that I love. I started being a youth leader at Impact, which has led to me becoming one of the leaders of the team now and feels like a massive part of my calling. And I traveled to Zambia for three months and sat in on an Into the Word course that took place here. And it transformed my understanding and appreciation of the Bible. And as I said, has led to me being standing here this morning. So even though it was super tough at that time to make that decision, to take some losses and to take a risk, I can look back on it now fully confident that taking that risk for God was worth it. That's not to say that I always get it right, please do do not misunderstand, but that's just one example where God shepherded me to take the right path. So if you know what God has called you to do, whether that's in the everyday or in the big picture whole life sense, then what this last verse is saying to us is do it. If the, God, if the good that God has got for you to do is to serve the church in a certain way, then do it. If you're called to be a witness in a secular working environment, then do it. If you're called to witness to certain friends or family, if you're called to give time and money, then give. 
Maybe you're called to do all of these things and more. What James is telling us to do here is to put our future in God's hands, to not reject the call when it comes. Maybe you feel like you don't know what the good you ought to do is, and that is okay. As I've just said, that summer that I left the job in Cardiff, I didn't have a clue. But I think it's just really important for us to have both ears open to God. And so I'm going to conclude this morning by getting back to the primary subject of the passage. How do you think about the future? Are your plans for the future about God's will or serving something else? The question that I would like us to walk away pondering this morning is, are we trusting our future into God's hands with an attitude of humility? These are sort of big questions that James throws up here to his scattered flock. Don't forget about the position these people are in. These are not just questions for those considering big life changes around your career or where you're going to live or things like that. Even if you're not in that camp, we still need to be asking these questions in the everyday because we have a God who is worth serving and worshipping with our whole lives. If you're not sure why that is, as Josh encouraged you, please pick up a Why Jesus booklet or come and ask me at the end or someone you came with why you'd want to give your whole life to God. We'd love to explain it. I'm just going to leave you with three brief final thoughts from this passage. The first is about living with a healthy perspective on eternity and the glory of heaven. It is the most amazing place where we can dwell with our God for eternity, unencumbered by anything that would come between us. Uh, now, between us as we live now. Do we treat that as if it is our genuine, eternal destiny? Do we think about it as a sure thing? Ultimately, that is where your future lies. You can be fully secure and confident in that um, if you believe in Jesus. And it is incomparably greater than anything we could gain here. <clears throat> anything. Everything else, everything that we have now on this earth will fade away. As Paul puts it in Philippians 3, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them worthless, that I may gain Christ. It's really important to have this attitude when we think about the future. The second thought, which is really summed up in the final verse of the passage, is about obedience. Are we individually and corporately being obedient to the call God has put on us? There are things that we all need to do in general as followers of Jesus to be obedient to his call. But there are also times when we individually have to make the choice to be obedient to God. Are we prepared to take risks to do that? Are we resolved to, as verse 17 puts it, do the good that we know we should do. My final thought is for us to consider what the sovereignty of God means for us. I think that to apply all these things, we need, really need to trust in the sovereignty of God and in his character. He is the one who can see the whole picture, even when we can't see what will happen tomorrow. And he, in the end, will make his name known and glorified throughout the whole earth. He who knows what is coming and can direct our path in the way that will bless us most in eternity. It's so natural for us to want to have control. That's my natural position, to lay out all of our plans in the way that we'd like to go, to establish those, those plans firmly. But underpinning all of our thoughts about the future must be a trust in God's sovereignty and that our plans should line up with his plans. So when we think about our plans for the future, whatever they may be, Are they founded on a trust in God? A trust that endures whatever twists and turns might come. I'm going to finish there by praying, I think. Could I ask you all to stand? Um, Yeah, Father God, I want to thank you um, for this book. Um, Challenging though it is, I pray, Lord, that you would... Um, you would encourage us to take steps forward in these things. Whatever challenges have come over the last um, few weeks, we've been studying this book um, and um, the various uh, passages within it. I pray, Lord, that um, these challenges wouldn't 
lead us into a place of guilt, shame, or fear, any of those things like that. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us to ask for your Holy Spirit's help and to take steps forward into um, the freedom that you've got for us. And as we were worshipping, actually, I just, um, I felt God put on my heart something um, around people who have callings that have been long buried. Maybe you, um, many years ago, you felt God put a calling on your life that hasn't, hasn't materialized as yet or hasn't gone anywhere. And I just want to pray into that as well. So if that's you, I'd, again, I just want to encourage you to um, ask for Holy Spirit's help in that. Lord, I want to thank you that you do have good works um, planned for each of us to do. I thank you um, that um, we are saved for a purpose as well as um, for your good pleasure and will. And I pray for anyone um, who has felt they've had a calling put on their life in the past, felt that you were steering in them in a certain direction, but it's been buried or, or lost to the years. Um, Father, I pray for anyone in that position. I pray that this morning um, would be um, a chance for them um, to dig that up. To engage with you, maybe it involves putting um, behind them some some hurts of the past or um, um, some missed opportunities. But I pray, Lord, that you'd reestablish that in, in those people. And that you would, you would enable them and allow them to ask the question, what is your will for the future? Yeah. Amen.